the first one, and the, uh, the main purpose of, or the main point behind most of the resiliency options is the concept of the, uh, the client being able to register, or splitting the registration between the user services component and the registrar component. In previous versions of OCS, these were the same, so a client would both register and get its user services from the same endpoint or the same endpoint in a pool, for example. This means that the client submits its SIP registration request. Uh, that would be the registrar component. The client getting things like IAM and presence updates, that's going to come from the user service component. In CS14, we split these two components to basically allow clients to register against one of the servers in the pool, but ensure that things like IAM and presence is going to be consistent regardless of where that endpoint registers for all users who are accessing concepts like I am in presence for users in that same pool. Uh, this, when we say that we split the registration services, we didn't actually split this out or have another server role. This concept is just different services running on your front end, service, front end server infrastructure inside of the pool. All the endpoints that you'll use, so if you sign in to multiple laptops or a laptop and a desktop, or maybe a desktop and one of the office communicator phones, we'll end up using the same registrar. We accomplish this with a change in the way the clients actually register. They will submit a registration request, but the client now has some logic built into it that leverages a hash and DNS to ensure that the clients register to that same registrar endpoint. So if I have a front-end server pool that has four front-end servers in it, each of my client endpoints, if my first one registers to server two, all of my client endpoints will register to server two as their preferred server. Each user is going to have a random order of the servers in that pool. So uh, low heat, for example, maybe the next user to register, uh, he will look at the four servers in the pool. His user object is going to be set for three, four, one, two, for example, all of his client endpoints would then register against endpoint number three in that pool, assuming endpoint number three is available. If your user registrar endpoint is not available, you will choose the next one in that list. If none of those endpoints are available, we'll cover one of the other scenarios around pool level failover or possibly an SBA to pool type failover in the later slides. So concept here around the registrar portion is your OC client or your OC phone client now has the ability to automatically load balance against all of the servers in a front-end pool for SIP registrations and for any conferencing or any other functionality that's going to hit that front-end pool. There's also a concept of backup and primary pools. So the first piece of HA is just the ability to do load balancing automatically from the SIP clients, meaning that we do not need a hardware load balancer when we're talking pure OC clients against a front-end server pool. However, if we're talking about server-to-server -server or client-to-server communications, that's HTTPS, so we have a browser-based client coming in for CWA, for example, that's still going to require a hardware load balancer. Those types of clients don't have a way to address the fact that there's multiple DNS registrations for this pool, and I'm going to choose one based on this algorithm that's defined on my user object. That logic only exists in the OC clients. The second point here is that we have the concept of both a primary and a backup user pool. So users can register against a primary pool, any one of the servers using their load balancing technique inside of there. However, if that primary pool is not available, the, endpoint, or the client will fail over to the backup registrar pool. And so this gives us the ability to do a little bit of site type awareness or site failover logic inside of the client itself uh, without having to provide any special stretched AD subnets or additional information across the WAN environment. This also applies for the concept of SBA, or our survivable branch appliances. The, brand, the users in a branch office where we have an SBA located will always have their SBA as the primary registrar point, but they will have your enterprise pool at the central site as the backup point. And so in the case of an SBA outage, they'll still be able to access services by going back to the central site pool, assuming that that WAN is available or the WAN is up. The way the pool level failover works is that we have a heartbeat interval defined on those pools. By default, it's 120 seconds. And so when we notice that one of the pools is down, the backup pool will then begin accepting client registrations for clients that are primarily homed or have their home set to the primary pool inside of that organization. So two main points of HA from the client perspective. One, the client load balancing piece for uh, different servers in the same pool. 
and two, the ability to have a primary and a secondary pool so your client can fail over from one of those pools to another. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Uh, in this case, right, we have Bob's primary registrar and his user services are set to, uh, to EE pool one. So when we enable Bob's uh, Active Directory user object for communication server 14, we'll select EE pool one as his primary pool. Alice happens to have another pool, so we've got pool two. Pool two could be in the same physical location, same data center, same AD site. Pool two could also be in a separate location. Perhaps we've got another larger location that requires a, a pool infrastructure uh, because people are doing things like conferencing down there and we want that activity to stay local. So Bob's primary registrar is pool one, Alice's primary registrar is pool two. We can go ahead and define for EE pool two that EE pool one is the backup registrar point. So now when Alice registers, she sees her primary pool is pool two, but she also has a backup registrar of pool one. We also have the concept of SBAs, or the branch offices with survivable branch appliances. In this case, we can configure each of those SBAs to also have a backup pool. So the SBA is pointing back to EE pool one as well. So Joe registers primarily in his branch location, but however, if his SBA goes down at that branch location, Joe will fail back to the data center enterprise pool one. So we talked about this concept of load balancing, right? We use this uh, uh, client-based load balancing for all SIP traffic. So all SIP registration traffic now, we no longer require a hardware load balancer for. Uh, that is purely just a client-based functionality piece to talk to the appropriate server in the pool. We do include in that capability uh, the ability to drain stop your servers. So you can set one of the servers in the front end pool to be drain stopped. At that point, if you had three servers in the pool and you drain stop number two, server two will stop accepting new connections and therefore those, new, those connections that were on server two will eventually be rehomed to server one and three. All new connections will go to server one and three. Eventually server two will be out of connections and we can take it down for maintenance or patching or whatever type of functionality that we needed. We also maintain the session dialogue for conferencing. So in the case that we had some conferences on server two, for example, inside of the pool, server two eventually crashes or goes down at some point, we'll rehome those conferences on another conferencing MCU inside of that pool and redirect the users to the new conferencing MCU that is providing the conferencing service. So we'll maintain conference session state across that in the case of a server outage. We're also caching at the client the connections to CS14. One of the, and when we say connections, what we're caching here is the FQDN and the IP address. Uh, what we found is that in many organizations, things like Active Directory or DNS may have an outage. When that occurs, uh, we would say, well, if DNS is down, right, that's your, that's your first issue. Uh, but the, really, the, for most organizations, communication outweighs things like DNS. So by caching the IP address locally, uh, we're removing some of the dependencies on Active Directory and DNS so that client services and communications can be maintained even if we have a DNS or Active Directory outage during normal operations. So you're seeing additional resiliency being brought into the CS14 architecture to help protect against these other type of outage scenarios that we may have. Oh, we mentioned the last piece there was uh, reconnections are very fast. Uh, in the last session, we showed you how quickly media will come back. Uh, we did a lot of optimizations in the media stack to ensure that media will resume as rapidly as possible once the network link or connection is restored. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the branch office resiliency. This is the area where we had no solution, really, in 2007 R1 or R2, uh, and we're offering an, a method for providing resiliency for branch offices now with CS14. We kind of break it out. These are kind of soft guideline numbers. Uh, what we're using here to determine is it a small branch, a medium branch, or large branch is do you have a technically qualified resource who's able to kind of assist and troubleshoot and or take over if something goes wrong or there's an outage in that branch locations. Typically in the very small branches, there may not be someone on site or have that capacity. We might be just looking at people who are involved in the day-to-day -day business, whether they be tellers or accountants or uh, whatever they might be doing in that role at that location. So for the very small locations, we probably don't have any local infrastructure. Those users are coming back to a pool in the central site. 
or we might have a PSTN gateway there so that they can have their telephone calls routed via gateway instead of via OCS at all. For medium branches, uh, where we're talking in the, the low numbers to up to approximately 1,000 users, we can implement what we call a survivable branch appliance. And so the survivable branch appliance allows users to retain telephony aspects even in the case of a WAN failure. Their primary registrar point is that SBA, so they register against the SBA. Once registered, they will use the connection, the WAN connection, for voice calls when that WAN connection is available. If the WAN connection is unavailable, the SBA will route their calls over the PSTN connection to that specific SBA. For larger branches, uh, we don't scale well, or the SBA doesn't scale well past approximately 1,000 users. And so there, we're talking about either a survivable branch server, which could be another pool, right, or a standard edition server providing all that functionality. So now we're introducing a new pool for that location, and users in that location would register directly against that pool. We'll still retain the concept of site failover or being able to have a, uh, the backup pool be the central site, for example. Uh, what we're doing in the larger branches is really deploying a full set of pool infrastructure. This also means that there are side benefits, such as the ability for conferences and desktop sharing or multi-party calls, for example, to stay local inside of that larger branch instead of having to cross and come up to the main location and come back down for that larger branch office. So SBAs, this is what we see as the common deployment scenario for CS14. We'll talk a little bit more about how some of these can be upgraded if you've got some hybrid gateways today, for example. Uh, but the SBA really has two connection points. There's a network connection point, which will plug into your switch at that branch office. And that connection point is going to have an IP address associated with that branch. And it, therefore, can route packets locally, as well as over the WAN back and forth to your corporate CS14 infrastructure. Your SBA also has a PSTN connection, so it's got some circuits. Those can be digital circuits, analog circuits, depending on the type of SBA you're procuring. And you'll have some digital or analog lines from your local telco run to that location and attach directly to that survival branch appliance. The SBA, as we said, can then route the traffic, whether it's uh, uh, WAN traffic or uh, PSDN traffic appropriately based on things like CAC and the availability of the WAN. The branch appliance is essentially just a Windows Server 2008 mediation server running on 2008 R2 as well as some dedicated silicon to connect over to the PSTN. It provides, the, the key piece of functionality it provides is the concept of a SIP registrar. So we mentioned that the Registration and user services were broken apart in CS14 by moving the registrar services away from things like presence and conferencing. We're then able to move the registration services to these smaller branch or survivable branch type appliances. When we're in a normal operating mode, clients will register against this SIP registrar at the survivable branch appliance and will uh, uh, do their conferences and other activities against the pool. We'll show a slide or two later where we'll show how some of that traffic will flow. When we have a loss of the WAN connectivity, the SIP registrar will also do some proxy and routing. So this helps us understand that when clients are coming inbound, if our WAN connection is oversubscribed, meaning that we exceed our CAC limits on that connection, we'll route the next phone call out through the PSTM. Unless, of course, the person has the override policy set because they're uh, a person who privileges has that capability. It will also take care of any PSTN routing or voicemail routing. We can route calls to that location to be output over the local PSTN portion. Right now, there's about five SBA partners, uh, Audio Codes, Dialogic, Ferrari, HP, and Net, who are providing uh, survivable branch appliances. If we look at them, they look something like this, right? We're talking about a 1 or 2U box that slides into your uh, rack at that location. It's going to have some ports on it for connectivity to the PSTN, and it's going to have a port or two on it for network connectivity. What you'll also find is that if you deployed some of these advanced hybrid gates, 2007 R2,
that information and retain all your configuration settings that you defined in that master topology document. This means that we don't have a, a person required to administer or change things like routes and tables and assigned users and, and dial plans, for example, on that SBA appliance. All configuration information is managed centrally. It's basically a, a, a dumb box at that location that's reading its configuration in off of that local store, which is replicated from the central configuration store. Basically, all of them will have a simple web-based GUI. This is the HP one. You bring it up, you give it an IP address, you specify some basic settings like DNS server, default gateway, etc. And at that point, it will become an SBA and follow whatever definitions that you defined inside of your topology. At some point in the future, you'll probably have users moving from that branch office to another branch office or from that branch office to central site or vice versa, and you'll need to modify those users and do some moves, ads, or changes. All of that will be done to your central store topology based out of your central office. So you use CS14, the new uh, management interface. You can add and define users. All of that information will be pushed out first to the central store and then replicated out to all the SBA appliances inside of your organization. This simplifies, like we said, the management portion from that as the SBA is no longer needed to have any local configuration or local setup around dial plans and other portions. Uh, that is correct. So each user is going to, uh, when you enable a user for, uh, so the question is, do users automatically discover or how do users, or do you have to assign the users to one of these SBAs? We'll show a little bit more about that in a couple of slides, but the, uh, the, in OCS and in CS14, when you enable a user for OCS, you also associate them with a pool. And so that pool w could be your central pool. Uh, in CS14, that pool can also be one of these SBA type devices. And what we're really setting there is what their primary registration point will be. They can, uh, the, uh, the SBAs, for example, will fall back, or the users in a, housed in an SBA would fall back to that parent pool as their backup registrar choice. But you are configuring the users to point to either the central pool as the primary or one of these SBAs as their primary registration path. Laptop users who move around are probably best housed in the central pool because if they're moving regularly, they, we wouldn't want them housed in a location that might have WAN connectivity outages or things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so the other piece of the SBAs is because this is running Windows Server 2008 R2 and the mediation server role inside of it, there's got to be some path for the vendors to get the patches and deploy patches to the mediation server role on the SBA itself. So we have a process for this. We'll notify them prior to the release of a hotfix or something that's going to impact uh, the mediation server role. They'll have a download and test period. We give them about, we give them five days prior to the release of the patch. We will release the update and they have all committed to us that within 30 days they will have tested that update and made it available for people who have purchased an SBA appliance. So the, the roadmap or timeline for patches and updates to your SBAs is 30 days from the release from Microsoft of the hotfix or patch that's targeting either Windows Server 2008 R2 or the mediation service that's running on that role. The next question you'll have is the SBA is only running the registrar component. It's not running the user services component. That means that we're going to provide some functionality during a WAN outage, but not complete functionality. So we have a list here, right? When the WAN is up and available, we will see the CS14 client showing presence and all rich contextual information. But when the WAN is down, we lose all the cross-site data. It's the ability to register or to, uh, to subscribe to presence updates, for example, for people who are on that user service pool is not going to occur. They can't read data from the pool level settings back at the central site. What we will have is PSTN inbound and outbound calling. They can create calls to the PSTN. We'll route the calls over the circuits that are attached directly to the SBA. We can do intrasite calls. So when we're calling peer-to-peer -peer inside of that branch, uh, that will be an OC to OC client call. Uh, we can also make calls from the branch to the central office, but it won't be routed over the WAN. It will be routed over the PSTN. So we'll route the call out through the SBA to the PSTN back to the central site. 
Basic functionality like hold, receive, and transfer will still be completed. Uh, authentication and authorization, the clients will register against that local registrar in the SBA. Voicemails available, assuming that they have the PSTN outbound access, so we wouldn't show their Exchange UM voicemail. That would be a web services call over the WAN, uh, which wouldn't take place, but they would be able to dial in and check their voicemail uh, via UM, or if they had internet access, get out by the internet for Exchange web services. If the user in that branch location wants to join an audio conference, if they click on the join meeting inside of Office Communicator, it will fail, right? The, that link is taking them back to the central pool over the WAN. With the WAN out of commission, that link won't work. If they have internet access and there's an edge infrastructure, it will go out over the internet, or they can dial into that audio bridge using the PSTN dial-in information. So they make an outbound PSTN call to the conference, enter their credentials, and they're joining the conference via an auto audio call. So what we lose, right, is anything that's going to rely on data transfers over the WAN. The WAN connectivity is down. That's IM and app sharing between the branch office and the central site. If I don't have network connectivity, I'm not going to be able to do data-centric type activities such as IM app sharing, IM or video conferencing, for example, or any type of conferencing back to that central location. We will see people, and we can initiate IM conversations inside of the branch, but we will not see their presence. The presence is coming from that central pool location, uh, so that doesn't appear. But we're still able to establish a SIP session with them because we're using the same SIP registrar as that recipient. So as, as long as both of us are registering against the SBA appliance locally, both of us can then establish an IM conversation. We we'll just won't have the, uh, like we said, we won't have the presence portion around with that. And then things like response group and call park also won't be there as those are going to rely on services running on the front end servers in the pool, not on the SBA itself. So partial functionality once you have a WAN outage and you don't have internet, uh, a WAN and internet outage, right? So uh, a data outage between our branch office location and the central site location. Question was around discovery earlier. So we're going to walk through the discovery process for a client homed on the SBA. We don't have a way yet of having clients automatically discover that there's an SBA local and therefore go ahead and leverage that as their primary registrar point for that location, even if they're homed on a different pool. First thing that happens is client boots up, client issues a DNS SRV query, we hit a DNS server, it will respond with the uh, director pool FQDN or whatever the primary pool FQDN is for that specific SIP URI. Client then submits a, reg uh, a uh, TLS request to the director pool to register. So it tries a SIP register against that director or our front end pool. And that director re response or pool response is not a registration. We realize that that user is homed on an SBA. And so we want to provide that user with a certificate. Next thing that happens is a front end server in the pool issues the user a client certificate. And this is different from what we had in the past, which was just a direct registration against that pool. Certificate is requested. You're probably wondering at this point why we're issuing a certificate out to this user at the location. Certificate is replicated out to the SBA. The reason for this is we want the user to have a way to authenticate with that SBA, even if the network and Active Directory and DNS are down, right? So if we, ha if we provide both the user and the SBA with a copy of a user provision certificate, we can do certificate authentication to the SBA in the case of a WAN outage or DNS outage or Active Directory outage in that location. We no longer need to ensure that there's an Active Directory domain controller and Active Directory DNS services to locally authenticate that user, give them a token, and allow that user to access the SBA. Once that certificate process is completed, the client will submit Again, the SIP register, and this time they'll get a SIP redirect, which will redirect them to the IP address and FQDN of that SBA. We'll then cache the IP address and FQDN of the SBA as well to ensure that in case DNS is down, and we'll use our locally uh, issued certificate, or the, the certificate issued to us by that front end pool to therefore authenticate against the SBA appliance at that branch office location. So it's a little complex when we throw all up, but the quick summary is, we try to register. If we don't have a certificate, we'll be provisioned a certificate from the front end server. Certificate is then copied or replicated to the SBA, and we'll use certificate authentication against that SBA to ensure that our authentication option stays up 
in the case of that WAN failure and or directory services or global catalog uh, failure at the location. All right, so let's take a look at some more registration scenarios, right? User coming in from the internet, but they're housed, uh, or their primary pool is the SBA. That registration will actually go all the way down to the SBA. Even though the user coming in from the internet it would be closer potentially right to that CS14 pool, we're gonna keep that registration identical to what it is as if they were locally inside of that branch office. During these conditions then, the WAN goes down. We lose WAN connectivity to the branch office. In this case, users will continue to register in the branch office directly with that SBA. They'll use their certificate credentials that they, or the, the certificate that they've been provisioned to for authentication. But external users coming in through Edge will realize that the connectivity to the SBA is down and use the backup pool. Backup pool is in the central site. The internet user is connected. We'll have full functionality. So the internet user in this location, in this scenario, will have all functionality: conferencing, IM, presence, video, etc. Uh, people in the branch location, as we mentioned, are going to have a subset of that because they don't have connectivity back to the main pool. The other scenario is the SBA is down. So at some points, right, our appliance could crash, or the port is bad, or someone trips over the cable. In that case, clients will connect back to their backup pool in the central location, both in the branch location as well as from the internet. So these users will come in, connect back to the backup pool, register, get IAM presence, conferencing, voice, etc., all that other types of functionality. The one scenario we don't show is SBA down and the WAN is down. At that point, those clients are not connected, right? So unless they have a path through the internet to get back to that central site, uh, if we don't have a data path, we are not going to be able to connect back to the central site to do that registration. So branch office server connectivity when the WAN drops, clients, as we know, use that cached FQDN and IP address as well as certificate authentication. We saw how he got a certificate when he first registered against the central pool, and we issued that certificate down. We replicated the certificate to the SBA. But at some point, you're going to get a new client coming into that office, right? And that client, during the case of the WAN outage, may not yet have that information. She doesn't have any of that cached information around DNS and uh, the ability to know where my SBA is located. So Alice comes in. She will issue a DHCP request. If you have configured DHCP option 120, we can provide the SBA FQDN inside of that option. So. Instead of having to provide DNS services locally, we give you the option in DHCP to provide what the SBA target address is and allow the client to read that from DHCP, go ahead, register against the SBA, and authenticate and get their services. So this, is, again, is another way for us to provide local branch resiliency without having you to put a domain controller and or DNS functionality in that location as well. Now let's take a bit of a break and we'll switch to what the data and signaling paths look like for each one of these scenarios. So we talked about media and we talked about signaling. Uh, each one of these is going to be a little different. Oops, sorry. Inside of the branch, all registrations or, or SIP requests, right, are going to go, signaling will go directly to the SBA, but media will flow directly peer to peer between the clients. So we'll always try to keep that media path as direct as possible inside of the organization. For PSTN calls, when the WAN is that, or when the uh, uh, WAN is not being used, this could either be a WAN down or our uh, call access control policy says that we've exceeded our WAN connectivity and we need to route new calls to the PSTN. Both signaling and media will flow through the SBA out to the PSTN and the circuit switch network. Same concept when the WAN is available, signaling will occur from the uh, from the client up to the main pool in the central location, but once we identify the recipient or the endpoint's IP address, media will flow directly between the two endpoints. So signaling will cross the servers as we look up or query the recipient's IP address, but once the signaling has been established, we'll then send media directly between the two OC endpoints. Branch users coming in through Edge, same approach. We already know that they register with the local SBA registrar. So they registrar with the SBA, but once they call someone in the central location, we will discover or determine that central location endpoint IP address, and the media flow will go directly from my internet endpoint to the location. 
we're not going to flow media all the way down to the SBA when the uh, recipient is inside of the main data center or close by there. Finally, WAN is down. Obviously, signaling will stay against the, S uh, the SBA. Data path is going to stay local. And signaling and data path is going to flow through the PSTN when that WAN is unavailable. Uh, we can't route the call of the PSTN unless we do the signaling and that path as well. So media flows to PSTN, it'll flow back into the central site, and then from that central site, gateway, IP, PBX, et cetera, to that endpoint inside the main data center. Edge user and the SBA is down. So edge user is going to come in, discover that the WAN link is down or the SBA is down. They will then use the backup registrar being the pool infrastructure in your central site once they've used that pool infrastructure, they can query the endpoint's IP address or the B party's IP address and then send media directly to that B party inside of the central site. If the SBA is down, clients will register with the backup registrar, that being the one, the pool in the corporate data center, but media path, of course, will still remain between those two clients at that location. We will send signaling uh, up to the front end pool, determine that the IP IP address or the recipient's IP address is in the same location and then send that media path directly to that other client. All right. Our, our next topic then is around the concept of data center resiliency. So we talked about this concept of SBAs and how the paths flow through that. Uh, but we have this new concept now of being able to define pools for failover. One of the points I didn't highlight yet for SBAs is if we have two pools, I can set pool two to be the backup failover target for pool one. If I have an SBA, I can set pool one to be the backup failover target for pool one. Uh, what I cannot do is configure a pool's backup target to be the SBA. So the only backup or resilient option for a pool is another pool inside of that organization. We will submit, when we do our registration or client sign on, a DNS request. That will, it, that will provide back to us a list of pools available in that organization. We'll query the highest priority pool and then attempt to register to it. If it's our home pool and it's our primary pool, that registration effort will succeed. If we're on another pool, we will be redirected to the appropriate pool inside of that organization. The primary registrar pool is not available. We will contact our backup registrar pool. If our backup registrar pool is accepting connections because we've exceeded the the heartbeat interval between those pools and the primary is down. Backup then will accept the registration. Client will go ahead and proceed with a bit of a limited feature set. And we'll show you what those changes are between the primary pool and the backup pool in terms of functionality being provided. If you've got this concept of the primary pool and the backup pool and you realize that you're not going to be providing or restoring service in the primary data center, it was the, the type of disaster which makes the server unrecoverable, at some point, we recommend restoring that central management server back to your secondary location and resuming the services there. The other option would be to rehome all those users to the backup pool and create a new primary pool for them and move them again. All right, so we look at this. We have two pools. First of all, a primary pool in Berlin, a backup pool inside of Singapore. Each pool has a set of users associated with it. For Berlin, the backup is Singapore and vice versa. If we have a failure, the clients that are in Berlin will fail over and register against that Singapore data center. They will then be able to conduct the list of functionality like this. PSTN inbound, PSTN outbound will all flow for them correctly. Intrasite, intrasite calls are successful. Hold, receive, and transfer. Authentication and authorization, they can log in and they will be able to see who's in their contact list and subscribe to contact updates. When they place voice calls, we will generate call detail records for them, we will submit those off to the monitoring server and record that information. Call forwarding, simul ring, delegation, team call are all there and you're all waiting for me to click the next button and show what doesn't work, right? Conferencing and the auto attendant through PSTN will not be available. Uh, scheduled IM, uh, AV and web conferences or the ability to create one, so using the Outlook add-in for example will not work. That will try to create the conference on the primary pool. Uh, the add-in does not yet have the capability to understand the primary pool is not available. I need to create that on the, on the backup pool. Uh, presence and do not disturb based routing won't work, so we'll be ignoring that type of setting once the user is homed on their backup pool. Uh, response group service and call park, voicemail deposit, and voicemail retrieve 
through a PSTN also unavailable. So we provide some level of failover services for the primary pool to the backup pool, but not complete CS or services on that failover process. This also brings up the interesting concept of the simplified HA. So simplified HA is instead of deploying an enterprise edition pool and having multiple servers in the pool, I buy two standard edition servers. I have two pools. I put 50% of my users on each pool and configure each pool to be the backup pool for the other one. The scenario in case of what works and doesn't work is exactly the same as what we showed you on the enterprise pool enterprise pool failover capacity just a moment ago. So clients attach to pool one, clients will fail over to pool two. What doesn't work is the uh, conferencing auto attendant portions, call forwarding, do not disturb presence, being able to schedule new conferences, and uh, retrieving your voicemail through the PSTM. Uh, so you have basic functionality in terms of failover, but not a full or complete functionality to failover from SE to SE. There's also the concept for voice resiliency. So we mentioned what some of the functionality is in terms of the SIP registrar media path failover options, but let's talk about how this discovery process works for clients to understand. Client issues their DNS SRV request. We will get a response to that. That SRV response will include both the director pool as well as my primary pool that I'm associated with. We'll then use TLS to go ahead and communicate with the CS14 director pool. We will register and authenticate director pool redirect us to our primary associated pool. If that primary is available, we will register. If the primary is not available, we'll register with the backup pool. So DNS query, DNS query gives us the director pool. Director pool will give us both pools. We'll try the first pool. First pool is unavailable. We try the second pool. The final topic area for HA is similar to what we had in 2007 R2. If you have the requirement to have two data centers and have a failure in one data center, allow your users to fail over to the second data center, but you want a full list of functionality to be provided and not the partial list that we provide you with the primary and secondary, you can deploy the metropolitan data center resiliency. The reason we call this the metropolitan data center resiliency is this relies on very low latency between both data centers. So the latency in terms of ping responses should be down in the sub 10 millisecond range, for example, uh, between each location. Uh, the scenario here is New York and New Jersey. They're separated by the Hudson River. We're talking about less than maybe five or 10 kilometers of distance between both data centers. That gives us a low latency WAN that allows us to do things like stretch the SQL cluster and stretch the, the, uh, the front end servers between both locations. So SQL clustering will be used as well as SQL replication, which means that if we have a failure of either one of those locations, we have complete service availability or service availability at the other backup location or other location. Nearly everything is available. There are some caveats, especially around PSTN. Uh, we would have to work with our PSTN vendor to ensure that in the case of a failure in data center one, the PSTN vendor reroutes the calls to data center two. So they need to be aware of an outage or failover event that we're having or have the ability to compensate for that in, our, in their uh, uh, PSTN connectivity to data center one. The features that are available, depending on not your version or your deployment of Exchange UM would be the ability to do voicemail deposit and voicemail retrieve. If my Exchange installation is also site resilient, I'll have this capability. If my Exchange installation is not site resilient, obviously I wouldn't have that capability. So if I fail over voice, but voicemail was on my primary site, I'm only going to have voice on my failover site. But as you can see, because we fail over the entire SQL database, which has all of your conference registrations, your pool settings, all the user configuration portion, that failover occurs in the background, which means that all that functionality is also available when clients fail over to the second location. The difference between the metro failover and the pool level failover is that it's the same pool. So now we have all functionality being provided for both locations. For the pool level failover, we're going to a different pool, which means functionality that's tied to our current pool doesn't work post failover and that failover experience. So that's a 45 minute or so, what time is it? Uh, 
quick deep dive into the high availability and site resiliency and client resiliency failover options. Uh, we'll open the floor now for questions and uh, take some Q&A and try to get you out of here a little bit early for the party. So, questions? Yes. Yes. Correct. So that would be a full on pre our full off premise exchange installation, which means that they're taking care of everything from messaging to voicemail and that solution as well. So that would assume that your cloud exchange provider handles Exchange UM. The, the, the question is, does the Microsoft BPOS solution around Exchange today offer voicemail? And the answer to that is no, I believe, than the current US BPOS release. It's coming, but it's not in the, uh, the one that you buy today. Everyone's looking pretty zoned out after a full day of sessions. <laughs> I can just see the haze. <laughs> Is it, the question is, is it clear when CS14 will be released? Uh, we are targeting the second half of this year. We are targeting a, which is now, right? <laughs> uh, you probably heard me say it, it's set up in deployment that we're not even at the release candidate stage yet. Uh, right, right, right. The, uh, the release candidate will, is targeted to be released as a uh, limited technology preview. We are targeting that for September. Uh, which would put us in time for a release by the end of the year. Usually it's a couple of months between a RC build and the RTM build of the, of the product. So it's, it's up to the tap, RDP customers and the, uh, the, the bug bar, et cetera, things like that. But we're, we are still on track on our schedule for second half of this year. Question. DH, the DHCP option 120? Yeah, that assumes that they've already gotten that certificate. So they're not going to, they, they, need, they do uh, certificate authentication, so they would need one prior logon. Correct. So, so when, you, when you do that initial, so for a new client coming in, so the question was, how does a user authenticate in the scenario where new client to the branch, uh, they don't have the DNS and the IP address cached because they just boot, they came in that morning, right? And the WAN link is down. Uh, but they, hopefully they were there at least at some point in the past. That means they had been issued the certificate already and they can do certificate authentication to that SBA. Or if you have a domain controller up there, we'd take something else as well. Yep, yep, no, I, good point. I, I, I meant to cover that in that portion and I, I must have missed that, sorry. Correct. So if that, uh, let's take the scenario where I am located in Auckland, my pool is in Auckland, uh, we'll use Wellington as our branch office location, and I've never been to Wellington, I'm homed in Auckland. I go to Wellington, the WAN link is down, I will not register or be able to register against that SBA and have IM conversations with the people in Wellington, for example. Uh, same scenario applies if I moved to Wellington, but I had never signed in at Wellington before the WAN went down. I would not be able to sign into Wellington because I wouldn't have that certificate local specific to the Wellington SBA. Will that work through Edge? Uh, that's an excellent question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, ooh, I, um, you know that? Yes. Yep. Right. Then Edge will talk to the director pool, which should give you the redirect and issue the certificate. So as long as you have internet connectivity, you would get the cert. Uh, but the SBA wouldn't get the cert. So you'd have the certificate, but you'd have to wait until WAN connectivity came up for the front-end servers to replicate that certificate down to the SBA. So you'd get, client would be okay, but SBA wouldn't understand the cert. Uh, I saw some, uh, oh, I saw, I think you had a, did you have a hand up? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. If you're in the TAP or the RDP program, the answer is yes. If you're outside of that, we only support deploying the IRC for testing purposes, et cetera. Uh, 
Uh, uh, you're more than welcome to deploy the RC candidate as a test environment platform, which may have people connecting and talking and doing the voice portions. <laughs> but if you call us for so the question is right: if you deploy the RC prior to RTM and you call us for support, the the premier side will tell you, "I'm sorry, you're, we can't help you." Because there's a what it is is there's a dedicated group in Premier allocated to the TAP RDP customers, and they don't take calls from outside locations. And the, because they haven't yet trained all of Premier for CS14 responses and answers and stuff like that. Yeah, question is, uh, so you, you've went down this unsupported path and you encountered a major bug, right? And you have to rebuild your servers. The topology builder, um, in the setup and deployment, you may have seen that I saved a copy of the topology locally. That is your, we don't have a way for you to, um, or we don't automatically back up your topology from that central management store, but at any point you can open the topology builder or run a PowerShell commandlet to export your topology to a local file. So that running that export on a periodic basis is kind of moving into our best practices. That would allow you then, if you had to restore or recover, to read in that topology information, which has all your IP addresses, server names, gateways, routes, etc., for your organization. <laughs> Correct. Another point of that is that's assuming we haven't changed anything from the RC to RTM, right? So that uh, I, I tell everybody, all bets are off until it makes it to RTM, right? Everything we've showed you today is is in the code, right? So it's targeted to make it there for RTM, but up until it ships, there's always a chance that one of these features could change or get cut. What you probably will not see is anything in addition to what, you're sh what we're showing today. We've had some requests from TAP and RDP customers, as well as from others. Uh, the common was is around being able to migrate both R1 and R2 to CS14, um, but the, the discussions on that are kind of still ongoing, so. Yes? Uh, question is, does the SBA have a SQL server on it? It has a copy of SQL Express, and that's what we use to replicate. Oh, wait, I take, um, I take that back. Uh, the SBA might just be reading the configuration and storing. Uh, I will have to get back to you on that. I believe they do not have SQL Express on the SBAs. So all server roles will have a copy of SQL Express. Uh, question is, does the SBA also have a copy of SQL Express? Because we covered the fact that all CS14 server roles will have a copy of SQL Express. Even your uh, uh, servers that are talking to us, like an Enterprise Edition server that's talking to a SQL instance, will still have a local copy of SQL Express. That's where we keep a copy of configs, so in case that central management store is down, that server can be operational. Uh, I believe the one exception to that is SBAs, but I, I have to check on that. So I, uh, I'll have the answer tomorrow. Uh, if you see us by the booth or something like that, I'll, I'll find out. Any other questions? Your hands. Oh, yes. How long does the cache? <laughs> I don't have that memorized either. How long, the question is, how long is the cache time out for those clients? I believe it's a week, but uh, we'll, we'll check on that. It's a significant amount of time because uh, the assumption here is that some of these locations might have frequent outages or outages that last a day or more, like a, but typically not more than like a week, for example. So we'll cache name, IP, certificate, et cetera, for that time period. How many of you guys like the concept of doing two standard edition servers and pool level failover as the, H, as the HA slash optional solution to give you some voice connectivity, right? Not everything will expose what doesn't work in the client so users shouldn't generate too many call requests. Uh, we see that as being pretty popular going forward, and uh, you're also seeing kind of the first iteration of this ability to do failover, right? So in that first iteration, you're seeing a list of about six items that don't work when we do the primary to backup uh, uh, registrar point. Um, the assumption here is that as we go forward, we're going to invest pretty heavily in making that simpler fail the client failover experience much more resilient so we can move away from the the metropolitan data center, SQL replication, et cetera, experience, but still maintain conferencing and other aspects that today are pool dependent. Yes, question. Yep. Uh, 
Correct. You can only uh, each client. So the question is, if you have an SBA and, a, and two pools in your organization, uh, your SBA is your primary registrar point. You can only fail back to one of those pools. We don't support yet having primary, secondary, and tertiary fail back points. So whether you're housed on an SBA or housed on a pool, you're only going to have one backup registrar option uh, for the pool level failover. But the, uh, but the pool could have, so if those are enterprise edition pools, those can have any servers in it, which should address some of that availability portion of the, of the pool failover. There's a article, some of you may have questions on this concept of uh, the client registration against that registrar portion, and I mentioned this DNS and hash and load balancing, and each client generates a, a randomized list of the servers and how they'll connect, or for each user that will connect, and so that ensures all endpoints always follow the same registration portion. There's an article out on, uh, on Nexttop, you'll find it a little easier, it's on TechNet, um, which walks through that very clearly. It's about three or four pages and will help you understand that client-based DNS hash and ability to fail over without a load balancer between the servers and the pool. Uh, yes? They are, uh, so the question is if you're going to manage a gateway device, is it simpler to just have a gateway or have a gateway with an SBA to manage? They're, uh, it's approximately the same. The, uh, so the gateway is going to have some ability to dial or connect to the PSTN or to your IPPBX or some other functionality, and it will expect a certain phone number to be dialed for that to occur. All of that up to the phone number dialing is stored and configured in your central topology. And so regardless of whether it's an SBA or just a gateway, we're going to, when we hand off the call by sending a SIP request to that gateway, we will hand off the call with the appropriate number to dial. So we'll normalize the rule for you through that mediation service, either on the front end server role or if you decided to break it out as a dedicated server role, we'll normalize the number, pass it off to the gateway. The gateway will then get a SIP request to dial a very specific string of digits. So we're removing some of that normalization. So in the past, what you were doing is normalizing potentially on a per gateway configuration, uh, which meant that changes to dial plans and routes meant going to all of your gateways and doing this update process. Uh, with CS14, it's you manage all your routes and where they, how they connect to each gateway centrally, and then we'll just pass off that connection to that uh, simplified gateway configuration, whether it's a gateway or an SBA. So, uh, did that kind of answer your question? So it's, it's, it, because we're handling it centrally, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter if it's an SBA or a gateway. Uh, uh, you shouldn't even, so let's take the simplest scenario. You have a standard edition pool and you want to, uh, and let's say you have a SIP trunk for some numbers, but you have a uh, legacy PBX and you have a gateway in between your legacy PBX and this front end server. Um, you want to be able to make calls to your PBX users and so that you have a choice of a regular gateway or an SBA gateway. Either one is going to be the same in terms of the admin experience for configuring your front end server to point to that gateway. No other servers are required. It's probably more expensive to buy the SBA gateway versus a, a basic gateway, so it would probably come down to cost. The configuration on the front end side would be the same regardless of SBA gateway or just a regular gateway. So you don't, uh, with your one front end server, you wouldn't have to add a role if it was a regular gateway or something like that. All right. Well, if any other questions, if you think of something, uh, we'll be headed over in about 15 minutes also to the, uh, the town hall. So we'll see you all there. Uh, look, hope you all have fun tonight. And thank you for coming. And please rate us highly. I think we're, clo we're two tenths, two hundredths, or three hundredths or so. So Low Heat is the track manager for UC. I think we're three hundredths of a point right now down from the innovation track. So he's, he's on us to make sure we do a good job and tell you to fill out your sessions, <laughs> or fill out your emails, sorry. <laughs>